Okay. I received the message that I have to to start. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sergey Ignatov. I'm a director of this university. I'm not philosopher. I'm Egyptologist. So my world is before philosophy, and uh, I'm supposed to say something in opening this uh, conference. To start with this, dear colleagues, professors and students, distinguished guests of our conference, welcome to uh, European Humanities uh, University. Welcome to this conference uh, dedicated to 30th anniversary of our university. 30 years ago, Professor Mikhailov started this project. European Humanities University was established in times of crisis after the collapse of the communist bloc. In 2004, it was shut down by Lukashenko and as a result of crisis moved to Vilnius. We are gathered today here at our university premises in the time of crisis, again, in the fourth month of Russian aggression in Ukraine. As you know, crisis comes from ancient Greek and means this decision. You can, we can say that uh, there is another meaning, uh, thinking, but it's coming from the root uh, krinein, which means decide. Thinking in crisis means thinking in, in, in thinking or <laughs> thinking in thinking, making decision. <laughs> uh, if crisis comes from thinking, decision, we could say that the other name of Homo sapiens is Homo crisis. And it happens, it happened maybe. 60,000 years ago, when the, the first Homo sapiens appeared in the globe. But all this, I would say, Homo sapiens, uh, Homo crisis belong to the past. For example, even today in the United States, there is a requirement for the graduate of secondary school. The graduate of secondary school is uh, supposed to know, to possess, to understand 80,000 words. 80,000. This is a good number. But at the same time, contemporary point of view of educated person is what? Contemporary point of view what is educated person? Educated person is a person who speaks English and who, have, who is experienced in finding needed information in Google. I remember this because uh, before coming uh, here, I was a rector of New Bulgarian University in my country. And uh, this university was established in the same time. This university is a twin brother of European Humanities University. And in the 90s, we were gathered in Salzburg seminar, and our teachers, our uh, lecturers insisted that contemporary educated person is not the person who possesses a knowledge, for example, of 80. at university in history to possess 2,000 names and dates, for example, of the history of ancient times. No. This is a person who speaks English and who can work with the computer, and that's all. So the former homo crisis or homo sapiens now is transforming in homo consumer. And maybe because this is, I, I, I think, as a teacher, that this is the biggest danger of our days, and maybe this will be one of the main line of discussion uh, in this uh, in discussions in this uh, conference. But there are good examples in our days, and I, I conclude with one very positive example. 
This is from the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian professor, as you may have heard, this is Fyodor Shandor. Uh, he went uh, viral last month, in the beginning of May, after a photo showed him teaching remotely while in full battle dress with a rifle uh, swung from his shoulder. We are fighting for an educated nation. nation. If I did not give lectures, it would be a sin, Shander uh, said in, a st in his statement. And this is thinking in crisis. Thank you very much. And maybe Professor Mikhail or Yolanta will continue. Thank you. Dear colleagues, good morning. Uh, thank you, Rector, for your uh, inspiring speech. Uh, and I think we have a lot of food for thought for our discussion. And uh, now we are starting the first session. I'm chairing the session. I'm Yolanta Beruskaita, an associate professor of European Humanities University and the vice director for research of Kazimierz Simonajic University in Lithuania. And uh, we have a couple of presentations in this uh, session. Uh, 45 minutes each, and afterwards we are having a uh, 30 minutes discussion. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you to our first speaker, Professor Anatoly Mikhailov, uh, a founder of uh, European Humanities University and a professor of the Department of Euro Humanities and Arts of this university. He defended his doctoral dissertation on the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, and his recent published articles are on language of art, on being and language, on European heritage as a source of crisis and as a hope, and on human being in the world. The research fields of Anatoly Mikhailov are German intellectual tradition, hermeneutics, philosophy of language, and of course, Martin Heidegger's philosophy. Professors, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, dear guests. I wanted to address to you as a lady and gentleman, but probably at this time it seemed illegitimate. A lot of things is questioned now in our days. This is also part of the, our thinking in crisis. What is used to be our common language sometimes is not valid anymore. So we speak sometimes about human beings in neutral personalities. Professor Ignatov presented himself as a non-philosopher, formally, allegedly, I belong to this sort of people, but I would like to present myself as a failed philosopher. And in this context, I would like to introduce the topic of my presentation. Dear colleagues, there are no lack of conferences and seminars going all over the world. And those people who call themselves academics, a sort of species, who are very inventive in creation various topics for conferences and discussions, and always justifying the necessity and importance of all these topics, are uh, doing it for many decades. Unfortunately, we have to recognize that not so much effect of everything that is going on. And my topic is called Thinking in Crisis on the irresponsibility of the philosopher. An entire book might be written under the title on the responsibility and irresponsibility of philosophy. This statement, no doubt, belongs to the tradition of the questioning by philosophy of itself and demonstrates the critical attitude towards the very nature of philosophical experience since its very beginning and differentiating itself from the mythical thought. But there is also something very special about this statement. 
we need to, to note that this statement was written in 1942 amidst the Second World War. And it belongs not to somebody who makes it in traditional manner of abstract con contemplation. Those who, whom Hannah Arendt ironically called the thinkers by profession. His name is Jose Ortega y Gasset, and he is the author of the great book, The Revolt of the Masses, published in 1929 and not properly appreciated in his time, and which in nowadays days of globalization has acquired the new value when we face ourselves presently confronted with the challenges of the time of globalization and active involvement of hundreds of millions of people from various continents and national traditions into the present world affairs. Ortega Gasset, whom Albert Camus called the greatest European writer after Nietzsche, while addressing himself to philosophy, adds, however, that the issue is intertwined with another more general theme, discourse on intellectual responsibility, stressing the personal responsibility of those who pretend presented knowledge about the society and human being in our troubled times, and, and apparently envisaging Hannah Arendt later comments, it belongs to the essence of being an intellectual that one fabricates <coughs> ideas about everything. And he adds something more radical. Intellectuals are no less corrupt than anybody else. According to Hannah Arendt, in this situation, stupidity has become as common as common sense was before. And this does not mean that it is a symptom of mass society or that intelligent people are exempt from it. The only difference, she writes, is that, stu that stupidity remains blissfully in artery under articulate among non-intellectuals and becomes unbearably offensive among intelligent people. Within the intelligentsia, one may even say that the more intelligent an individual happens to be, the more irritating is the stupidity which he has in common with all. Very radical statement. But why? to single out the special role and the responsibility of the philosophy. It is evident that the crucial contribution to this intellectual disorientation of the previous 20th century was made, first of all, by philosophy. As a result, its whole development since the beginning of this century, 20th century, has underwent a painful revelation of the basic principles that in the course of centuries were determining the nature of philosophical knowledge and society on the whole. It means that the way of experiencing reality, which was enjoying its highly prestigious and privileged status in society since the very beginning of European civilization, became highly questionable, identifying itself in the form of philosophy as a means of providing wisdom, the method, or a proper worldview. Philosophy thus became self-obedient sort, sort of knowledge, existing in a form of specialized discipline, pretending to provide guidance and judgment on all possible issues. However, with the progress of positive knowledge in all its forms, cosmology, theology, biology, psychology, and physics, it became clear that the authority of that, what was called after the publication of Aristotle's text as metaphysics, and was aiming at the possession of integral perception of reality, had been discredited. It is by the way, somebody by name of Kant, 
whose philosophical thought as never before gets stuck in the exclusively exclusivity of professional argumentational games. It's, it is opinion of Peter Sloterdijk. As a consequence, he, said, he writes, since the critic of pure reason, it can be acknowledged that the massive scale of interests in philosophical propositions must be based, based on misunderstandings. However, it became clear already by the end of the 19th century that the significance of this tradition not only loses its previous vitality, but becomes even threatening to the very existence of European civilization. Philosophy became grow growingly isolated from the needs of society while transforming itself into the professional, professional philosophy of the philosophy, philosophy professors, Schopenhauer. This became clearly deadlocked at the beginning of the 20th century, with Edmund Husserl as one of those who first recognized the danger of the loss of the, loss of the great faith in the reason, which men of the Enlightenment possessed. Hasserta Gigaset refers to his dramatic statement in, in Husserl's book, Formal and Transcendental Logic, that calls European sciences for fundamental reflection. And I quote Husserl's words, we now live in a world that has become incomprehensible to us, a world in which people strive in vain to find the purpose and the meaning of their doing that were once so clearly known and fully acknowledged by intellect and will. And this is again echoes by Hannah Arendt's comments, much later diagnosis of situation in her very lapidary style. Thought and reality have parted company, and reality became opaque for the light of the thought. I know that philosophy has a special role in determining and decisively influencing the very way of development of the whole European intellectual tradition. Such thinkers as Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, Hegel, and many others implicitly or explicitly presented through their theories, theories, main principles and norms of living for their contemporaries and future generations. It was the tradition of German idealism culminated in thought of Hegel, we demonstrated that philosophy has reached such point of its completeness after which it became clearly already in the second half of the 19th century that philosophy, in order to survive, is inevitably facing the necessary radical changes. Merleau-Ponty says, with Hegel, something comes to an end. After Hegel, there is a philosophical void. There is not to say that there has been a lack of thinkers or uh, geniuses, but that Marx, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche start from denial of philosophy. You might say that with the latter, we enter the age of non-philosophy. But perhaps the destruction of philosophy constitutes its very realization. Perhaps it presents the essence of philosophy." End quote. The revolt of Søren Kierkegaard against the anonymity of the system, which has, in his opinion, sacrificed the individual, indicated the danger of degradation of philosophy that was steadily losing its vital existential dimension. According to Peter Sloterdijk, again, we are dealing here with dangerous phenomenon of world estrangement of philosophy. He maintains, Peter Sloterdijk, that since the end of the 18th century, we are facing the beginning of an oddly history of weakening address of man to man. 
der ausweichenden Zuwendung des Menschen zum Menschen. Strangely enough, according to Sloterdijk, it was Kant, whose works, while systematically addressed to the public, can be regarded as milestones on the way of moving philosophy to its unpopularity. I quote again, Sloterdijk, after Kant, philosophical thought has as never before get stuck in exclusivity of professional argumentation of games. As a consequence, since the critique of pure reason, it can be acknowledged that massive scale of interest in philosophical propositions might be best of means. I said it already. It makes, it makes clear that Ortega Gasset makes his comments in full understanding of a deep crisis the Western civilization is experiencing. In a number of articles written in exile from his native Spain in years preceding the Second World War, he was expressing his alarm regarding the spiritual situation in Europe. Here there are only some of his statements. I quote, we need only state that the present inner crisis of thinking is such that we refrain from likening it of hand to any other that has occurred in Europe's past. Another quote, one of the greatest misfortunes of our time is that the peoples of the West coming up against the terrible public conflicts of today, have found themselves equipped with a wholly archaic set of notions on the meaning of society, collectivity, the individual, <coughs> customs, law, justice, revolution, etc. A good part of the disorder of the present due to the disproportion between the perfection of our idea on physical phenomena and scandalous backwardness of the moral sciences. Most of the statesmen, professors, distinguished physicists and novelists have opinions on these subjects worthy of a small town barber. It is not then quite natural that it should be a small town barber who sets the tone of the time, asks Ortega Gasset. And he concludes, alertness is what we require. We are not allowed to confine ourselves with our professions, but must live in full view of the entire scene of life, which is always total. The supreme act of living is a consummation gained by no single calling and no single science. It is a yield of all occupation and all sciences, and many sides besides. Ortega is not alone in this feeling of alertness. This year, by the way, we observe 100th anniversary of the publication of Oswald Spengler's book Der Untergang des Abendlandes, The Decline of the West, the first volume of which was published in 1918 and the second volume in 1922. However, however in already the last quarter of the 19th century was characterized by a new motive of existential thinking following productive insights of Søren Kierkegaard, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Diltai, Berg, Andrei Anil Bergson, and many others. At the same time, we need to note that impulses for renewal of the philosophy were coming mainly from the outside of the mainstream of philosophical tradition. Such names as Jean Baptiste Vico, Johann Georg Hamann, Friedrich von Kleist, Friedrich Hölderin, Goethe, and many others who preferred not identify themselves 
as philosophers. And again, Edmund Husserl belongs to such kind of outsiders who came from mathematics. In this context, it's important to note that Husserl critically addresses the state of affairs in German philosophy. For instance, in his letter in September of 1910, he was writing to his, to his colleague Heinrich Rickert, famous German philosopher at that time, that he is terribly ashamed and horrified of the quality of what he was reading in German philosophical journals. Just take a note, it is powerful German philosophical tradition. And he is horrified what is going on there. But particularly, probably, that this tradition was very strong. It was possible to expect that within the framework of this tradition, the power of renewal could be just established. Because not powerful tradition or something like imitation of tradition, just continuing to do something under the name of philosophy. And this is the biggest problem. You know, at that time, when Husserl proclaimed his famous slogan, zu den Sachen selbst, not properly rendered in, 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 in English or in Russian, as to think themselves, Sache is not think, not think. But still, it is something what was refreshing in the philosophical knowledge. He tried to undermine conceptuality of philosophical way of, of thinking, which, which was too fixed and imposed on reality. And it was continued then by his uh, famous people, uh, Martin Heidegger, in his Opus Magnum Being and Time, published in, in 29, 20, 27. Of course, this critical attitude toward philosophy is not new. It accompanies its existence from the very beginning, including its founders, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. In the Republic, Book 7, Plato says, the mistake at present, at that time, is that those who study philosophy have no vocation. And this, as I was saying before, is the reason why she has fallen is into disrepute at that time already. Her true sons should take her by hand and not bastards. <coughs> Heaven, however, there is something very special about it now. And this is our timing about philosophy. There are more than 2,500 centuries from the time when Plato expressed his concern. But what has happened to this way of thinking? What does it mean presently doing philosophy in the time after the end of philosophy? Martin Heidegger. Ortega is not only alone who describes history philosophy as a, as a regress. But still, I would refer to, uh, to what he said. Those who call themselves philosophers begin their encountering with philosophy as a publicly established and man maintained occupation. It means that they occupy this philosophy for unauthentic reasons. For security and social prestige, it offers as a profession or pure but no less authentic motive from curiosity or enthusiasm that all these motives are unauthentic. If unauthentic to varying degree is shown by the fact that they all presuppose an already existing philosophy. The professional philosopher learns and teaches ready-made doctrines. The enthusiast beholds the completed systems 
and is delighted by their accomplishment, by their accomplished form, and so on. But this is most pernicious, for we risk becoming immersed in occupation whose inner meaning we have neither time nor opportunity to discover. And then, again, Ortega, we are in constant danger of swallowing the standard problem hook, line and sinker, and performing mechanically from mere inertia the established mood of thinking. In this perplexed and confusing time of an unauthentic state of affairs in philosophy, when most contemporary philosophical schools are epigonical in their nature, Hanarit, philosophy still endures as a social reality and being taught as a special discipline at the universities. However, as Ortega comments it again, the professor of philosophy may happen not to be no philosopher at all. He teaches philosophy, philosophy in order to make a living or to be socially distinguished. No wonder he concludes that after the philosophy has enjoyed prestige for many centuries, we are facing now the situation of the waxing and waning, warning the prestige of the philosopher. Andrin Peterzak, a philosopher from Netherlands, describes the present existence of philosophy in the following way. The existence of specific philosophical community is determined by acceptance and following special rules. It takes its own basic conviction for granted, especially in its regular meetings where it celebrates the memory of past and present heroes. Protected, protected against intrusions, it can then speak the family language in conversations without being questioned unnecessarily about your axioms and postulates. Institutionalization of philosophy as a specific type of experience separated from religion, religion in our time of modernity, takes a, a form of relying on some chosen names and text, which becomes the main basis for personal orientation in professional development. And I quote again Petrzak. The works remain the models that are emulated by less established philosophers. When these come together in their conferences, they complete by individually presenting the results of their solitary preparations. The most ambitious among, among them try to rethink the fundamental assumptions of the general orthodox, orthodoxy, revise or apply some of these issues. A period of questions and answers opens the possibility of a discussion, but rarely does the exchange transcend the level of unilateral clarification, and the result contradiction of friendly confirmation. With regard to the motivation for giving talks and papers, one can even can perhaps argue that the modern conception of, of philosophy favors career-oriented competition and private profit won by individuals rather than a common concern, concern for truth. It's not surprising, he continues, that some individuals excelled in producing what that project wanted all thinkers to produce. Not everyone is able to maintain the methodical separation between abstract, transcendental ego that thinks and concrete ego that lives. Some are more suited than others to the modern model of observation ex experience, more pe perspicacious and inventive or more lucky in the modern sense of the world. The most gifted and intense, intensely focused individuals have a chance to become a, a stars or even sons in the realm of thought. They will be celebrated as leaders whose proximity must be sought even if might want to test the degree of one's own originality by challenging them. 
Another important issue in philosophy is also its linguistic articulation. When Latin disappeared as an academic language, philosophy became more and more national, when many people, even professors, no longer deemed language, knowledge of foreign languages indispensable for, for their profession. It, it brings then in education the provincialization of national philosophies and it is no longer considered as an obstacle for university very thought. In some countries, uh, notes Peterzak, ignorance on foreign languages was even encouraged in the name of patriotism. Notwithstanding the claim that philosophy is and should be autonomous and universal, we have come to live in a situation where thinking seems irremediably scattered among French, German, Anglo-Saxon and other branches of philosophy. In addition to splintering into national families, philosophy has also differentiated itself in an analytic, phenomenological, existential, feminist, African-American, Asian, Christian, Jewish, secular, metaphysical, ontotheological, modern, postmodern <coughs> philosophies. All these names conceal a host of problems. We need to recognize in this situation that we are confronted with something in George Steiner's formulation, the Byzantine domination of secondary and parasitic discourse over the immediacy, of the critical, of the creative. It is itself as a symptom. Commentary is without end. In the world of interpretive and critical discourse, book, as we have seen, and gender book, essay breeds essay, article spawns article, secondary texts are about secondary text. It is not like as Ecclesiast would have said it, that of making books there is no end. It is that of making books on books and books on those books, there is no end. It seems that we prefer to forget the warning of Ionesca, only those who have something to say should speak and write. This is why Martin Heidegger think of our time as the least philosophical time, while recognizing that philosophy has dried up. In the lecture course published under the title Was Heide Duncan, he writes, what most calls for thinking in our time, that calls for thinking is that we are not thinking yet. No wonder, concludes David Wood, that bubbles that philosophers blow open without too much fall out. In the rare case of demonstration of such critical self-attitude philosopher of, of to itself, Gianni Vatimo, famous Italian philosopher, echoing the idea of the absence of relation to totality of spiritual life or philosophy, includes the book The Responsibility of Philosophy, I have it with me here, This is the book, Responsibility of the Philosopher. I will just quote one sentence from this book. Now philosophy is what you are thinking about you have when you have nothing else to think about. In, this, in that case, sense, perhaps doing philosophy corresponds not so much to a talent or vocation as to a defect or rather the re reinforcement and institutionalization of a defect. In philosophy, what is being thought professionally, underlined thought professionally, is the interludes of existential specification. 
When professional specialization is dormant and totality of spiritual life assumes higher relief, if academic study of philosophy did not exist, if it were notionally feasible as a profession, nobody would dream of, of emphatically qualifying absence of specific thought as thought, and then he concludes. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a parasite. And it is not just ironic pose, he said. I mean, the question comes to my mind, how long will the government continue to pay the salary of philosophy professors? Such voices are unfortunately very rare. Business is philosophy is doing as usual, if, as if nothing happens. The question, however, formulated by Sarah Berlin, why should philosophers have a special claim to the right to express themselves. Okay. Again, this pattern of responsibility, personal responsibility, unfortunately, are rarely demonstrated by those who call themselves professional philosophers, but rather from such writers, poets, painters, and musicians as Paul Valéry, Van Gogh, Kafka, Klee, Ionesco, Bachmann, Hesse, Broch, Zamiatin and many, many others who do contribute through their creative attitude to the ancient tradition of idea of poesis, their personal responsibility, responsible reaction to the challenges of present world. In his speech in Munich in 1976, named Der Baruch des Dichters, Dichters you know that Baruch in English is not properly rendered as a call, as a profession. It is something that has from calling Baruch, it is something I'm, Baru, I'm Baruch, so I have certain kinds of responsibility. Elias Canetti, the author, among other things, of the crowds of power and dazzling, presents a pattern of such responsibility. He refers the words of the unknown poet, without mentioning his name, who in August 23, 1939, just one week before the beginning of the Second World War, was writing, it is now too late. If I were a real poet, I could have prevented the war. It is a very strange formulation, asks Canetti. How come the poet claims that he was not able to prevent the war? But behind of this statement, explains Canetti, is an understanding that such catastrophic events as a war was preceded by intensive propaganda that made people ready to be engaged in it and fight for it. It means that the power of words has a sort of magic that greatly influences human behavior. But if propaganda can exercise such influence, why poetry, was asking the poet, could not do it? And this is the biggest problem this unknown poet is not blaming others, although they have probably enough reasons to blame and to criticize others, but he blames himself for not being able to participate in preventing what has happened. This is very important that from poet comes this feeling of responsibility. And I will conclude. In 1999-2000, in his conversation with Ricardo Dottori, Hans Georg Gadamer, the great philosopher, 
of the wealth of the last century who, who was born in 19 and died 2001. Probably his last conversation gave to Dottery. Would say something, saying something like this. In essence, we are headed directly towards a global crisis. And this, after having seen to it that we have ourselves, by the way of science, have threatened to destroy life on our planet. We must, our, must ask ourselves whether there is anything to prevent us from allowing us to occur. I will continue citation of the academy, sorry for this. This last version that this escaped, I will. It's important that such citation will be um, fully commented. In essence, we are headed directly towards a global crisis. And after having seen to it that we observe the way of science, have threatened and destroyed life of our planet, we must ask ourselves whether there is anything to prevent us from allowing this occur. I think humanity is more likely to go down this semi-catastrophic ro road. It might even become an epidemic, he was saying in 1999 or, nine, or one, 220, an epidemic that can one cannot control, that one can, cannot predict, but he was predicting, anything at all could make it so that our angst, the same word also in German, angst, brings humanity to a halt. If angst, as it were, threatens everywhere, everyone, then perhaps there is a hope that people will come to an understanding of some sensible conception of transcendence. Perhaps people will begin asking themselves why we are born without being asked, why we die without being asked, and so on. Let me conclude with this citation, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. As far as I understand, our second speaker is online. Not connected? Uh -huh. Shall we wait a bit just to maybe someone could uh, call the professor because we're waiting? Or we have a, just five minutes for a very brief question. I believe you have lots of questions after this. Is presentation can't say <laughs> very inspiring but it's really enriching uh, and uh, while we are waiting for the second presenter uh, maybe someone would like to ask a question yes please yes. shall i introduce myself uh, i think it would be yeah. better to present of course yeah. Yeah. probably somehow possible yeah. do we have microphone might is it possible okay. probably take one microphone we do not need two Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I, what I wanted to ask you, sir, is uh, is it generally possible for good to win over evil without becoming an evil? Because 
the good, the, the, the instrument, the main instrument of good is the thought. Not the weapon, not the beast, but the thought. And is there a chance for the good to defeat evil without becoming anger, anger, anger entity? When they come to the issue of the crisis in thinking, it, mean, it means that you should make very radical conclusions, because in the situation of general talkativeness, we can get used uh, to all kinds of alarming statements, and it becomes also instrumental in our way of, of speaking and talking. And there is a certain kind of immunity and notability to understand the real danger. The problem is, when we speak about crisis in thinking, we, have, we should be able to question the basic principles of this thinking from the very beginning. And if we are speaking about truth, then we have to, I, ha I need to remind that uh, in our common understanding, truth is something what, what, what is expressed in correspondence of our thinking to things as, as if such things exist as such. But behind of this, there is a certain kind of position of self-confidence of, of those who pretend to possess the truth. But if I'm speaking about something which exists per se, as such, outside me, I tempted to forget that I do not have my own position outside of the world. I'm inside of this world, and I'm programmed by this world, I'm indoctrinated by this world. There is still, before I'm dying, I live in this world, and I'm, 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 I'm bound to, to be also following the rules which this world imposes on me. I'm not able to escape it, and this is a problem of thinking. Either I will question the principles which were imposed on me by the fact of my birth, by the fact of my environment, my language, and so on and so on, or I will be just uh, take it for granted, and this is dogmatism. And this dogmatic attitude, it is, it is something which is opposite to philosophy. The very beginning of philosophy is uh, not simply like, like uh, also satisfaction of curiosity. Philosophy is, uh, is proper, it is created in opposition to mythical way of thinking, which was not simply just distance way of attitude toward reality, but living in the reality, experiencing of this reality. And this reality was something was provoking me to act according to my perception of the world. So the world was perceived in such a way that it is, it is uh, threatens my own existence. I have to take it seriously. There is a great danger that Within the framework of our thinking, we idealize in the world, we impose on the world our criteria of thinking in certain kind of fixed forms and relying on the thinking. But it, 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 it is a great mistake. The problem is that how come that the problem of truth is, is, is became also a logical truth? But we know that logic. Hannah Arendt and even Hegel were saying that logic could destroy thinking. And this is something that is not, it, is, it seems questionable, but it's again, logic is an instrument of, of providing also arguments to, to prove um, that somebody is right and somebody is wrong. And this is the biggest problem. So I think the, the the topic of our conference, the crisis in thinking, it is much more deeper than should we be able to question something what escapes of our questioning. This is the biggest problem.
Thank you so much. And I believe we continue our discussion after the second presenter we already have online, Frederick Worms. May we see the professor? Yes, hello. And Frederick Worms is professor of philosophy at the Superior Teachers Training College, uh, where he manages the Center for the Study of Contemporary French Philosophy. The work of Frederick Worms is centered on the history of philosophy, where he is a recognized specialist of Bergson and has also developed a general hypothesis of the history of philosophy as applied to diverse aspects of 20th century French philosophy. Moreover, Worms has worked on general moral and political philosophy. He has also received Moron Grand Prix uh, for philosophy of the French Institute. Professor, the floor is yours. And he has some books in his library. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I have my own personal library behind me. Mm -hmm. I, do you hear me? Yes, yes. There is a sort of echo. Um, but uh, um, I try to lower this camera. Okay. Um, thank you for your invitation and sorry for joining me uh, now and uh, being obliged to, to and, and from a distance and being obliged to to um, uh, to, to leave you after after uh, my lecture and discussion. I'm obliged by few uh, responsibilities at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, and I had to do you right after the discussion. Um, I, I want to thank uh, your uh, Humanities University and Pobilas uh, for this invitation to a conference in critical time, on crisis in a critical times, and I suggested to, to develop um, um, some ideas on what I call vital criteria for uh, critical times and for thinking the crisis uh, plural in our uh, contemporary time. I, when I suggested this um, this um, this topic, um, we hadn't entered what is a new crisis and what seems in the first. Uh, in a first uh, time and in a first intuition to contradict my, um, my personal uh, proposition, but I think I will take it as a confirmation. Indeed, I think one thing is striking the world today, but in two different ways, with, with uh, the new crisis that um, occurs in the center of Europe, which is uh, the war in Ukraine very close, of course, to where you are talking today and where I am so uh, deeply moved to intervene from Paris. Um, there are, um, in fact, um, uh, two ways in my, in my uh, impression to understand the way in which the war in Ukraine is adding up, so to speak, to the preceding and indeed remaining crisis of the present times. The way the war is uh, adding up in our historical moment to the preceding and continuing crisis of, uh, for example, the pandemics and the climate, global crisis uh, that were that occur before the war and will remain during and probably, of course, after uh, the war um, itself. The emergence of a political war in the center of Europe um, is um, in the first uh, impression contradicting, but in the second impression confirming the interpret the, the meaning of these, uh, what I would call these vital crisis of the pandemic and, uh, and the climate and the, uh, the, the planet uh, crisis, uh, so to speak. The first interpretation um, which I will partially adopt um, is, in fact, to oppose the two kinds of crisis. It is as if the uh, return of a war in the center of Europe, the return of a war between um, uh, countries in a, in a, 
in this continent um, divided by former world wars and, uh, and, and cold wars, it is as if the, the return of the war was the return of human history and political history as opposed in a way to crises that seem to be the, um, the contra on the contrary, vital. That means in the one sense medical with the pandemics or technical with the, uh, the, the uh, fragility of the planet due to uh, the heat, heating of the planet and the technique, the technical effects of uh, human uh, activity on, the, on nature and global, uh, global warming. Um, the, the war in Ukraine seems to be the return of politics in a world um, haunted by the return of nature and biology. And so the first, um, the first in interpretation of the, the war would be to, to uh, would, would uh, hear as a reminder, don't forget human history, human divisions, and politics. But of course, um, this reminder uh, is only to naive um, biological uh, uh, inter interprets and what I would call a reductive vitalism. Uh, of course, the pandemics and the heating of the world, the global warming and the global uh, virus are uh, where I have never been strictly speaking, biological crisis. They were also political crisis, of course. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, um, the, the way, and I will, that will be my, uh, my conclusion in a way, the way we have to, to deal with uh, uh, the global uh, public health and the global uh, um, <clears throat> um, planet, um, planetary questions have to be political. It is also the political divides, the, the global uh, injustices that, that endanger the planet and that cause the, the public health um, uh, dangers in, in each country, in, in many countries and in Europe, and also in a, on a world uh, scale. So, of course, the, the war in Ukraine is only reminding is only reminding polit political uh, questions to those who would have tended to forget them, but in in themselves the the, the vital crises were of course um, uh, political in their own right. So that is the first lesson, and it's a first lesson only for those that I would call uh, uh, essentializing and re reducing uh, re reductive vitalists or biological uh, thinkers. But then there is a second lesson, a second interpretation that is more paradoxical and that I want to defend also, and, and that will maybe be a little more risky for, um, for, um, uh, for our uh, discussion. And the second lesson, which is to me uh, far deeper in a way, is that um, not only does the, the, the war remind us of the importance of politics, also in the, in the sense of, um, of uh, the, the, the virus or the climate crisis, but I, I, I want to defend the idea that um, the war itself is a vital crisis. It is, a, of course, a political crisis, reminding us that uh, human history and human politics have not ended with the climate and with the, the emergence of life as a global problem and uh, survival as a major issue for generations to come. Politics are, have not disappeared, but in a way, um, it has a second lesson, which is uh, maybe a little bit <clears throat> less intuitive and, uh, and but to me it is much deeper and it goes to the es essence of our understanding and thinking of the crisis itself. It is in the sense, <clears throat> the way in, in which the, the war itself is uh, a vital crisis, a crisis in a vital meaning, not only in a historical and political meaning, 
a crisis in a vital meaning that we need to understand from the example of the pandemics and the climate uh, and the climate crisis. And so the, the opposition between the two types of crisis has to be surmounted for us to understand the global moment that we are enduring and living. And so we have to understand what is common to both types of crisis as both vital and politics and political and not only one and not one crisis as merely vital and the second as, as merely political so we are we do have to understand how the climate crisis and the, and the, and the political uh, wars are only one and the same types of crisis in our a new moment historical moment that is both vital and political and uh, this is this is the topic i want to discuss with you very briefly um, and of course you have to remind me how much time i have and to interrupt me if i am too long at some point so what so i want, I to, want do, to do to, <laughs> what i want to do to to briefly sketch a demonstration of my point is um first to go to go back to the uh apparently strictly speaking uh, um, vital crisis of the pandemics and the climate and mostly on the pandemics and to show how they are not only political in a in a vague sense but how they they give us a very precise meaning of what a vital crisis is and then i want to apply this meaning of the vital crisis to the war itself to human wars today and i will conclude by the um, the the way we can we can uh, first understand of course with the mean with the with the help of philosophy with the help of philosophical thought and also fight with the help of our political institutions all the crises of our times so I, I want to go beyond the opposition of um, beyond the vague of the concept of crisis beyond the opposition of two kinds of crisis to give up a precise concept of crisis common to uh, the events we are sharing and enabling us to, to fight them with uh, common tools. So this is the sketch of my, this is the, the, the goal of my very short uh, presentation and very much, maybe much too uh, ambitious um, uh, talk uh, this morning. So um, uh, let us understand uh, what a crisis means in a biological, clinical, or medical context, such as the pandemics, such as the, the pandemics in, a, in, a, in a, what we endured in our um, uh, political societies, and we are still enduring. Of course, the, the, the pandemics is not over, and it's very interesting in a way the, the way uh, a crisis is can be a long-term crisis, which is not a very intuitive concept of crisis. But I will, I will, I will precisely. I want precisely to, to. Um, this is precisely one major point I want to to sketch because um, uh, we are um, divided in our in our uh, interpretation of the concept of crisis between two extremes between an inst and two extremes which uh, include a, 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 temp a chronological dimension and temporal dimension which include time. Crisis can have two extremes in our minds in a, in a time thinking uh, uh, perspective. First crisis is thought of always as an instant. It's an event that divides and that's the, maybe our most intuitive concept of crisis. And then today we have this concept of uh, perpetual crisis, which are devaluating and even lead us to, to criticize the concept of crisis. What, what is a continuing crisis? It seems to be a contradiction in a way. So we are divided today between the two extremes of an in instant crisis, like a catastrophe, a, a sudden death, and at the other hand, a continuous crisis, which is, seems to be our new condition and which seems to lead to a critique of the concept of crisis and, and, and uh, uh, to abandoning the concept of crisis, which is going much too far. 
Between that, there is another concept of crisis. And this concept of crisis is, to me, um, biological, clinical, medical, but it, it also has to be uh, used in a context of the pandemics and the, and the climate uh, situation in the world in a political sense. What is this concept of crisis? The concept of the critical, the concept of crisis has a clinical meaning as opposed to the concept of the chronical. A chronic, chronical disease um, is, a, is a state where you have a, a continuing problem, a continuing negativity in a, an individual body or in a collective society, a continuing, uh, a chronic, a, a perpetual problem, but which has degrees. And of course, the crisis in this, in this context, as opposed to the chronic, the crisis is not the emergence of a sudden problem out of a blue sky, as we say in French. It's, it's not the, the lightning in a, in a blue sky. And it's not also, and it's not, uh, and it's not either a continuing extreme danger. The crisis is a peak of a, of a chronic situation, a peak which is defined by a mortal degree of the vital danger, which is permanent in itself, but varies in degrees. So that um, a, a, a viral um, a situation, for example, a, a pandemics, um, situation uh, can lead, and it will be the case for in some time for the coronavirus uh, pandemics, will lead to um, um, a chronic uh, presence of the virus with uh, hopefully uh, an avoiding of the critical peaks of the virus. And of course, what I do think is that um, the model of the chronic disease has to be applied to, to politics. Uh, human uh, lives and individual lives and, and collective lives are pervaded with what uh, we could call some internal negativities, which we cannot make disappear, but which we can contain, as we speak of chronic disease, which can contain to avoid the critical peaks, critical being defined as mortal. There is no other definition of the crisis except by death. Crisis is always the critical peak of a continuing problem. Critical being defined by the, not the possibility, but the imminence of uh, the dying, uh, the, the death uh, uh, perspective. And so we can say that life is a chronic disease, uh, continually fighting for its perpetuation and avoiding the, the mortal peaks the, as long as possible. And of course, the virus is uh, the, the fight against the virus is uh, uh, fighting against critical peaks in that first sense. But then there is a second sense, and it brings us back to the war in Ukraine in, in, in five minutes, in two minutes. What was the, the pandemic crisis exactly about? The pandemic crisis was not um, only a, a biological crisis in individual bodies, for example, avoiding avoiding your or my um, infection with its uh, potentially mortal consequences. The political, the, some say biopolitical, of course, crisis of the virus. And I, I don't want to use the concept biopolitical because it would, be, it would lead us in too many controversies in Europe today. But it, of course, it's the topic of my talk. But um, um, what was the pandemic crisis exactly? And what is the, the climate crisis exactly? The, the, the virus crisis was very precise. It was uh, uh, the threat of a mortal peak, not only for individuals, but for health systems in our societies. We have health systems that are designed to fight against uh, critical disease, for example, intensive care services in our hospitals. And in fact, the, the, the lockdowns, 
the, the measures, the political measures against the virus were designed to avoid not only individual crisis, but the crisis of the health systems in our countries, which were in, in itself uh, designed as a, as a major um, political um, device to avoid political crisis in our systems and to, to preserve the, 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 the very continuity of the, of the, of the, of the of human society. So the, the, the medical crisis and the planetary crisis are not instant catastrophes. They are not continuing catastrophes. They are a way to define and prevent the peaks that would be destroying societies, either by destroying health systems or destroying the planet. And so this is why we define some, some scenario and some um, uh, where the global heating would be a, a real catastrophe for the whole uh, human species on Earth, and we are trying to prevent it. So this is the biological concept of crisis, avoiding the mortal peaks of structural problems, the mortal peaks being not only individual, but collective, institutional, and historical. So this is my, the concept of crisis I wanted to, to, to present you today with. And now I come to war and human history. Of course, you can think of war as, um, as a, a fight between um, uh, human liberties arising from nature and creating the realm, the realm, uh, uh, the, the domain of uh, of uh, liberty as opposed to nature and history as opposed to nature. That was the philosophy of history that defined uh, uh, Western philosophy from the last two centuries. But the way I want to define war and also tyranny, internal war or civil wars and tyranny, as well as external wars in our uh, countries and especially in Europe, where the war in Ukraine can appear to us and is defined actually, I think, by the, the actors themselves as a, a war between brothers, a fratricide war. Um, and this is why it is striking us as so, uh, so, so, so specific in a way, with some injustice for uh, uh, more faraway wars in that, that we, we tend not to think of with the same intensity. The, the return of war in Europe and the return also of tyranny in our democracies, the specter, spectrum of, uh, of tyrannies in our democracy, to me, I will put it very briefly, are also revealing as mortal peaks of structural and vital dangers between human beings, just as the, the virus and the, and the global warming. Of course, this would imply what I call critical vitalism in philosophy, a philosophy of life that understands that life is, is not a substance in itself, but only a fight against death and against negativity, which takes various forms among various uh, living beings and human beings be, being specifically fragile uh, living beings with various kinds of dangers surrounding them, not only biological dangers, but ethical and political dangers. And among the political dangers, what I call the internal violations and the internal, uh, uh, internal conflicts and negativities between human beings coming from, from the, within, from the, the very center of, uh, of human life. And so the, the, there are some uh, constant negativity within and between uh, human beings that are threatening their societies and that the institutions are building to prevent. And this is why political institutions are trying to prevent human conflicts and, um, and uh, international uh, institutions. And the question of peace is, uh, is led to prevent internal uh, viola violations and, uh, and internal uh, wars. And, and at the peak of that uh, fratricide and brother brother mur brother murders uh, between uh, between countries and as well as within countries internal divisions uh, that can be 
that can be deadly. And this is why we build institutions just as we build medicine to avoid internal dangers, which are chronic, to become critical and mortal. So this, is, this would be my interpretation of democracy versus tyranny and a peace versus war. But why is the Ukraine war so, so telling in, the, in that sense? The Ukraine war is, is not, uh, I, I don't think it, it moves Europe only because it is uh, on its soil and, uh, and with no interest for the other wars in the world. I think what is very striking with, uh, with, um, with the Ukraine war are two things, which are to me leading back to, to vital interpretation of it. The first thing is the concept of repetition. The Ukraine war um, is a sort of reliving of preceding wars in Europe, not only the Cold War, of course, some people speaking of the Second Cold War, as uh, others speak of the Second World War, but it's also, of course, a repetition of all the wars of the uh, 20th century. And what is this repetition leading to? It's not, it, it seems to be um, uh, a contradiction to our, our spontaneous uh, philosophy of history, of course, philosophy of history uh, with uh, liberty coming out of nature and the uh, philosophy of progress and of, um, and of uh, progressive peace. And of course, um, I think um, this is the dialectics that we have been living with under the progress notion for so long. So repetition seems to be a regression and seems to be contradicting progress which it is, but it's not a contradiction, it's also a confirmation. But more profoundly, the repetition of uh, wars are telling us that we are facing a structural human problem, a chronic disease, which has some critical peaks and which we need to build institutions to avoid the critical peaks of their structural dangers. And so the reviving of, um, of uh, preceding wars uh, is an obligation to think of the structural dangers between countries also in Europe and also within uh, among neighbors. And more precisely, I think the, the, um, the, the, the current uh, wars are reminding us that uh, uh, we have to build institutions to, to frame the, the, the human conflicts even between uh, neighbors and between uh, close, uh, close uh, and even more between uh, close countries, just as we have to do it between uh, within a, a, a human family or a human community. And this is the difficult task of democracy and democratic institutions con conciliating opposite interests, which are conflicting and which are pervaded with with negativity and that we, we, are, we have to build institutions to prevent uh, human dangers. So um, the war is not the, re the mere return of human history. It is a confirmation that human history is pervaded with the same kind of vital and critical dangers as human life in general. And we have to think of living human beings as living beings with a, a various vital dangers and, and we need vital criteria to fight all these common dangers. And so I am led very briefly to my third part and conclusion. Um, to me, this, this, this very quick confrontation of the major crisis of our times lead us to a new philosophy a new kind of philosophy, a philosophy that I would call critical vitalism, which is a, a philosophy leading to uh, 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 the criteria, uh, the criterion, the, the common criterion of uh, life and death as the only uh, possible criterion for us, but with various applications and specific applications to human dangers and human history as such, and also to human action against the, the critical dangers, of course. So um, um, I want to, to, to make a, 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 rap, a brief um, uh, his, historical reminder in the history of philosophy and then a, a brief uh, conclusion on what I, I would call the global action against the global crisis of our times. But again, my, my goal in this paper was to define, to have a, to give a precise concept of crisis, 
fighting against the two mistakes. The first mistake being the, the, the theory of crisis as a mystery, as an event, pure event, like a lightning in the blue sky, or a, cri a blurring of the limits of the crisis in a continuing a confusion. And this is the danger of our times. And so this orientation in a, in a, a pile of crisis, a, a, an accumulation of dangers. We need a, a, and we have a precise concept of crisis, which is this, um, this critical uh, uh, border between uh, life and death and the chronical and critical in, in individual and biological, as well as political and collective uh, societies. This is where I would, I would, uh, I would find only very few um, uh, help in the history of philosophy. One of them, of course, and I say, of course, for Povilas, because we met in the, in the context of the um, um, global uh, Bergsonism project in philosophy. One, one critical vitalist, in a way, helping us to understand the question would be Bergson. Uh, in mostly in his last book, of course, the two sources of morality in religion in 1932. In, a, in another time of various uh, uh, different crises, where Bergson in the last chapter relates the war crisis to the vital essence of humanity in many ways. For Bergson, of course, the, the wars were founded on the limitations of uh, human species in the evolution of the elan vital the human species being as such a, a closed result of an open impulse of life. The limits of, the, of life would, would um, oblige the human species to, to abandon the, the, the creativity of life for um, defending their lives against death and, and leading a society to war as opposed to, to other societies. This is the opposition between closed and open society. This is, of course, a critical vitalist approach because it, it shows us that life is both open and closed, uh, creative and destructive, and it goes up to, to human history. But of course, it's, um, it, is also, um, it has also a metaphysical limit that it, it defines humanity by closeness and openness by going beyond humanity to the mystical appeal to peace, which is very important in its own sake, but which is not the way I want to, to, to work today. In fact, I do think that the, 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 the vital dangers, the crisis, the critical dangers of human life come from within humanity and give us an orientation. And we, we need to, to build not only mystical answers, but critical answers and, and prevention devices that are in their own rights, global creations and universal uh, universal tools for humanity. What we need to build is global prevention systems. In, in the domain of health, and I, I was a member of the French National Ethical Committee for eight years, and what we need to build what we call public health systems, preventing the societies to collapse. We need to prevent, to build critical limits to the global warming, and the two degrees limits is in its sense a critical answer to a critical time. And we need to build global human prevention against, against wars and against the crimes. For a long time, the nuclear dissuasion was such a critical tool in a way. For some time too, we had, we had uh, international law to prevent wars and, and to punish the extreme crimes of, for example, genocide. These global tools are necessary. This is the only answer to, to the global crisis today. And of course, the, the war in Ukraine is reminding us that we need to build this global prevention tools against political dangers, just as against vital dangers, that is global warming and, uh, and pandemics are examples. But we are not lost. We have, a, uh, we have an orientation. We, we know what kind of crisis we are facing. And it's the same kind of crisis in the times of Ukraine as it is in the, in, in the, in the fires and the, in, the, in, the, in the climate uh, crisis all over the world. These are, these are crises that are the burning of a chronic problem. And we know how to prevent it. And we should 
understand that preventing crisis is our is our duty today and that in prevention we will find also a creation because as Bergson just very deeply put it um, the real opposition is not between uh, death and life but between destruction and creation and fighting against destruction is always a, a requirement of creation and creating new institutions to a new medicines and also new ways of living against the new critical dangers is not only necessary it is possible and i thank you very much Now we have uh, not 30, but even 40 minutes for discussion and Q&A. And uh, while asking your questions, before asking your questions, please introduce yourself and uh, please tell uh, whom the question is addressed. Yes, and I see the first hand, please. So I would like to address my question. So Dennis Dushinsky, the European uh, Humanities University. Thank you very much. So, so first of all, for your presentation, and my question will be about the practical application of your conclusions. So you said, if I got you right, that uh, one of your conclusions is that we have to treat uh, the ecological, global ecological crisis, the pandemic crisis, and the war crisis, the war in Ukraine crisis, along the same lines. And you say that we have to establish the new institution for that. Uh, we actually have such an institution, at least one of them is called the United Nations, okay, and uh, with, with a varying degree of success it, it tried to cope up with all the three crises, actually, but, well, uh, ultimately failed at least with the war in Ukraine. Are you dissatisfied with the United Nations? Uh, what new principles would you establish for the new organization that would treat all the crises in the same way? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> lower the sound. Thank you. Of course, we do have uh, some institutions, but of course, also uh, we have to be disappointed with them, and because they, the the problem is not um, is, is that um, um, they are uh, they are necessary, but they they proved twice fragile, and their fragility is in front of the new crisis call for, for new answers, of course. The first fragility is in fact, um, I, I would say political because the, the chronicle political problem is also a war between humans. And of course, uh, this war between humans in the, in the last uh, period was led, led to a, a, a violent uh, attack uh, against universalism and against uh, these global institutions. So in, in all countries in, in Europe and the world, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> during the pandemics in the United States, for example, with uh, the former American president, was a, was a very violent attack on these global institutions. And for good reasons, because we, we should never think that these institutions are accepted. They are in themselves a fight against the divisions that are remaining in, within societies and between societies. So we should never take them as for granted. They always emerge from wars, the First World War and then the Second World War. And, and the fight against them is continuing. And we all have nationalisms in our countries that are even in, this, in the face, in, even in front of the global crisis, they are attacking this global institution. That's the first point. So we have to defend them and um, and they will always be fragile. And the second point is that to me, to reinforce them, we have to ask for very minimal but global goals. And this is why I think the, the only institutions that are working today are global but minimal. I don't have time to develop, but that, that's my, my, my major point on this subject. For example, the, the, the global um, law, the courts, the courts in The Hague, for example, for uh, in, uh, great, uh, you, uh, human rights violations, they seem to be nothing, but they are not nothing. It's a minimal, um, it's a minimal institution fighting uh, way after the crimes, but against the major crimes and not for uh, all countries, but it, it, it does exist, it is minimal. The, the global uh, climate conferences, 
they are building very minimal common objectives. It's very fragile, but this is this is the way we should go. And I think the you will never have a global peace, a global world community, but we have to 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 fight for very minimal um, uh, common uh, interdictions and common and common objectives. And I think the war in Ukraine reminds us remind us that um, international law has some uh, has some limits. But also, for for example, the the American intervention in Iraq was also a violation of international law and United Nations uh, minimal interdictions. So so that in a sense, um, yes, I. I I, I might be one of the last people to to believe in these institutions, but not in an abstract and granted and easy way. And um, but to, to fight for very concrete, minimal uh, treatises that are that are building the global community. And for example, I think the pandemics will oblige to some uh, global public health. Uh, minimal situation for example the for the vaccine access and it's not the case already but but it is at least a problem now and for the global warming it is at least a common problem now and for the peace i think it's complicated because of the return of totalitarianism in major countries and uh, but we have this is why we have to to discuss about it and not to give up about it. From our guests, please. I'm going to be translating for Francesco uh, Alfieri, if it's all right. Okay. Mi chiamo Francesco Alfieri dall'Italia, sono molto contento della relazione che ha tenuto il professore sulle varie crisi e vorrei, prima di fare una domanda, fare una piccola premessa. Credo che il problema oggi non siano le crisi. Ok, so uh, I am Francesco Alfieri from Italy and I just want to say that I'm so happy about your uh, speech about different kinds of crisis. And before that, before continuing with my question, I would like to say a little something. Ma è come vengano gestite le crisi? Per me il problema della crisi è il sottofondo politico che c'è sempre. Ok, that for me uh, the problem, the, the underlying problem within crisis is always the, the political management of that of them and how crisis are managed on a political level. Allora la mia domanda è molto diretta. Traduci questo. Uh, that my question is rather direct. Dato che l'intellettuale deve pensare, almeno deve fare questo. Uh, okay. Uh, since that uh, academics have to think. Non crede che la crisi tra Russia ed Ucraina. Uh, don't you think that the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. Non avrà mai fine finché will never end until l'Unione Europea gestirà male questa situazione. Uh, the European Union will uh, manage better this situation. E, e dunque la mia domanda è perché non iniziamo a pensare criticamente sulla Unione Europea e su come ha gestito questa crisi tra Russia ed Ucraina? Okay, so my question is, uh, why don't we start thinking critically about our European Union and how it actually managed the crisis between these two countries? E mi and I would like to have your risponto. opinion about this. That's all, I think. Grazie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, grazie tanto uh, for li, per l'italiano. <laughs> um, yes, I think it's a very it's a very good question. Uh, to me, um, the European uh, Union is what I call a critical institution. That is an institution that um, that um, allows for internal division and that. Uh, 
that is um, that is a, an institution based on um, first it was a result of wars of course but even in economic uh, management the, the European Union is is not what people think it is not it is not a, 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 a bureaucratic tyranny the European Union is a, is an institution based on critical compromises between contradictions within Europe and so I think I, I do think that, um, in fact, uh, in fact, Europe is uh, is is making some progresses. Of course, it's not it's not perfect and will never be, but it's making some progresses these days because it is going back to its essence, to its essence, which is fighting against uh, against crisis and allowing for internal criticisms and and the building of compromises. And of course, it is always disappointing because. There is a communal refusal of war, but then you have also compromises within Europe. You have to, they, they are the, there are different voices in Europe, different uh, points of view and, um, and uh, different histories. And, and I think this is, this is always the problem. It is always fighting on an external side and on an internal division. And, but to me, it's a strength. And of course, we can criticize, but uh, I think we are in six months, in three months, maybe uh, it's it's been a, we have seen great um, great progress. The reminder of the the, the very essence of the uh, institutional project of Europe, and uh, I think uh, I think I'm I'm not optimistic, of course, because it's very fragile and the the, the negative forces are very strong. But um, I think in a way Europe is um, is. Without Europe, we would be more desperate because there, there wouldn't be any tool, any institutional tool to to fight the crisis. So, so I think the the possibility of institutional um, devices and tools are is real, and Europe is an example. But um, it, it is fragile, but it's not nothing either, and and um, and it's uh, one of the very seldom uh, reasons to to hope today. Thank you. We have two more questions. And first of all, uh, Professor Viktor Martinovich. Uh, if our conference, this, this uh, question goes to both of the speakers. If our conference would be called doing in crisis instead of thinking in crisis, yeah. what would you recommend us to do to overcome the crisis we are in? Thank you. Probably start. I will be. Okay, thank you. This is really a very good question. The very title of our conference, Thinking a Crisis, seems as usually a little bit controversial. We are already going out from the fact that there is a thinking which we do possess. It is ancient tradition from the ancient time, animal rationale, Homo sapiens, thinking it is something that differs us from animals. But animals are provided genetically with their ability to survive and to live in various kinds of environment. And this was accumulated in millions of years. In assumption that we think we assume that thinking belongs to us as something like our ability to see, to hear, or to taste. But to what extent thinking it is something like this? Hannah Arendt was stating that thinking could not exist in some cases, and she fixed the situation of absence of thinking in the case when People were well educated, by the way, in the case of Eichmann. It is conclusion, that the absence of thinking. And again, the problem is of, this is a repetition of Heidegger, we do not think yet. But the problem is that comes also back to the issue of Nicomachean ethics of Aristoteles, who said that there should be no difference be between knowing, thinking, and our doing. And we know something what we can do. The biggest problem of our time is that we are 
able to dwell on everything, we explain everything, all this post factum, all this commenting on something. But why didn't we where we were not able to learn proper lessons from terrible previous century and there was more than enough signals for us to understand and some of them, some of us who belongs to older generation could remember well that 20, 22 years ago there was huge enthusiasm. There is a certain kind of magic attitude of the human being toward the time. We celebrate best days and we, we celebrate also certain kinds of ceremonial also events in the life of nations and societies and everything. And at that time, when we were meeting 2000, it was not only 21st century, but it was third millennium. What kind of huge enthusiasm was at that time, we thought that behind of us it was this terrible time, but again we were with huge illusions entering this 21st century. Why so too late? Why we pretend that we already thinking? And what does it mean thinking in separation from ability to do something? There are a lot of those of us who know how to comment, recommend, complain, criticize, not to be in agreement with somebody. So what? Should we continue the same? Should we need another war to understand that there is something terrible is going on? Why so late? And what is the quality of something, what we call thinking? This is the biggest problem. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Worms. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, Indeed, there are two, two kinds of thinking, and um, but um, 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 the the point is to me the the model of the medical and the clinical thinking. The the moment you you really uh, define a a vital problem and you 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 um, you assume the reality of a crisis uh, with criteria of the crisis, and you you. You of course criticize also the the ideological uh, discourses uh, around the crisis because crisis is also uh, provoking ideologies and uh, and denials and uh, and uh, and various kinds of uh, non thinking. But the the moment you really um, confront uh, the crisis with vital criteria, you are already doing something. I don't want to have the opposition between thinking and doing because. The real thinking is already doing something, but of course, and, and so this is why I I tend to oppose the phenomenological tradition, opposing thinking and um, and acting and life, and to me the the, the Arantian position is is very deep, but at the same time it's uh, it has some uh, dangers to it because it tends to to cut itself from the practical solutions to, to vital questions. And it's a contradiction that it's not the place to discuss. But, um, but to me, the real opposition is between the ideological and, um, and also the criminal thinkings that, um, that avoid the problems and that aggravate the problems and the problems that, and the thinking that fights against the problems and gives some criteria. So, so I have a sort of vital criterion in thinking itself. You have a kind of thinking that uh, aggravates the problem. And I think that there are some philosophical thinking that aggravates the problem. And to me, some ontological traditions do aggravate the problem because they, they lead us away from our vital condition. And I don't, I'm not thinking of Anna Arendt so much here, of course, but uh, some others. And, and you have some thinkings that confront the problems and that you shouldn't oppose them to doing. Thinking is not neutral. Thinking is a vital activity, and thinking can do good or bad. And you have also ill thinking, and you have bad thinking, and you can think of doing ills to someone. I don't think the the tyrants are not thinking. I think Putin is thinking, and he's, he's thinking about destroying the, his, his enemies, and so and, and so is Trump, and uh, so you you have um, you you have a, a, a sort of you you need a, an ethical criterion between thoughts. 
And we all have bad thoughts too. So I am not idealizing thinking. I do think there are some truth and there are some science. And of course there are some demonstrations and the, but um, of course, and I, I'm, I'm not really in accordance with Hannah Arendt uh, saying that evil is the absence of thinking. I don't think Eichmann was not thinking. And it's not the, um, the absence of thought that uh, defines, uh, defines crime. It's the, the, the orientation of thoughts towards uh, ill doing to, to others and towards war. So this is a major, of course, difference in philosophy, but uh, no, not everybody has to agree with, uh, with uh, the opposition between thinking and non-thinking. I'm more in an opposition between, between, um, between vital and mortal th thoughts. And this is the, the essence of critical vitalism. Well, thank you. Uh, one more question. Yes, please, you, please. So there is something good about telling crisis, like in developmental psychology, you might remember the typology of crises by Freud or by Ericsson. If you do not pass, if you do not take uh, this challenge, you do not develop. So a crisis like a driver of development. So a question to both speakers. Do you think that there is anything good about the crisis of thinking? And more specifically to Mr. Warren, to Professor Warren's. So do you think that there is anything good about the, cri the types of crises that you've mentioned? The pandemic, the war, and uh, actually the global ecological crisis. Do you think that in today's situation there is something uh, specific about the crisis that gives you a uh, hope that we still can learn something for the future? Unlike, uh, well, in the previous secrets we didn't learn anything as it happens to be. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> You want me to start this answer? Or? Yes, I do. I do because um, the crisis is so so uh, obvious in a way that we can't escape it anymore. And denial is is still here, of course. The the, the fact is that you 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 we 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 in this room probably and and. Of course, elsewhere we we are obviously uh, admitting the fact of crisis, but some some people deny it. Some people fl flee it in a in a, a war between human beings, and and so uh, to me it is uh, another stimulation that uh, yes, um, uh, thinking about the crisis is already acting against it, uh, um, and um, the crisis is so obvious that it it should and will oblige people to to do something. So. So yes, I do think that um, that we maybe we we think uh, only in times of crisis when everything is doing is going well. Maybe we we are not uh, thinking anymore. And and in my generation in France, where for example, in, uh, our colleague just mentioned the, the 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 hopes that we had 32 years ago, of course, and and also we this hope and this the, the sense that history was over was also the 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 illusion that um, that prevented us from really thinking the, the the problems that remained. And then in the same 1989 year. You had the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you have the Tiananmen Square oppression. So, and we didn't really think about it, but we the wall fell, and China just oppressed his its young democratic uh, students. So, so I think yes, we today we 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 are obliged to think, and we are obliged to think also in in, in front of of dangerous thoughts that surround us. Question. How would you comment? This is also a famous saying, which also Hannah Arendt refers to, tanto je suis, tanto je pense. Tanto je suis, tanto je pense. How would you comment it? Because it's again the problem that, that there are some people who act and there are some people who pretend to think. Can you repeat the phrase? Tanto je, tanto je suis, tanto je pense. Uh, I, I can't uh, hear you. Tanto je suis, tanto je pense. Can you spell it? Tanto je suis, tanto je pense. It's an expression of the Anna Lenz, the powerless, powerless 
euh, Anna Arendt qui disait « Tantôt je suis, tantôt je pense ». Ah, quand ah, je oui, suis. Oui, oui. Ah, voilà. ouais, comment vous pouvez commenter cette expression Elle propose de Quand je suis, je pense. Well, um, it is true, of course, that we don't think all the time. Uh, it is true that uh, living is not always allowing us to think. That is absolutely true. And of course, she was right to say that we we needed to be done with with the labor of life and uh, and we need to have uh, to to have health and uh, and and food and everything and 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 that uh, uh, thought can be destroyed in human beings and of course deliberately sometimes if you want to I I had a PhD student who worked on Hannah Arendt and also what she called logical torture. And even without uh, starving someone or fight or beating someone, you can prevent someone to think just by putting some, some madness in it. And for example, in the Uyghur camps in China today, if you read the papers, they, they have such kind of torture. For example, they, they put some prisoners in front of a white wall and they oblige them to say it is black. And the prisoner says it is white and then he is beaten. And so he becomes mad. So of course, thought is very fragile, but I, I, I draw the very opposite conclusion to Hannah Arendt's uh, because to me, the fragility of thought uh, implies that it is a vital activity. It can be destroyed just as, uh, just as our, the rest of our lives. So of course, thought is very fragile and uh, it's not given. We don't always think it's very fragile. And even when it appears, it can be dangerous too. It's, it's human thought that, give, that brings people to suicide. It's human thought that give, brings people to nihilism. It's not the absence of thinking, it's the fragility of thinking. So I, yes, I, I think Anna Arendt is at her best when she, she tells us about the fragility of thinking, the way totalitarianism is destroying it, the political conditions for thinking. But then to me, it's another proof that thinking is vital. If you see it that is, is there is nothing like this, like absence of thinking. Then we are coming to the next issue, that thinking or alleged thinking exists in certain kind of form. And these forms are so different and are so unique and sometimes little comparable. In each case, we pretend that this is a thinking. But sometimes it is nothing to be compared in, in the, quali on the way how people think. And this is the biggest problem. What do we mean by thinking? Kant, as you know, uh, wrote two first critiques and they were also addressed to the problem of reason. Practical, pure reason and practical reason. But last critique was called Urteilskraft. It's not reason. It's something different. What it is? Urteilskraft, it is something what, what is, and I think probably Kant has certain kind of reasons. You were speaking about politics. Again, sorry to repeat too many times how Narit. She discovered, not only she, but also in the third critique of Kant, there was discovery of the new way of, okay, let's call it thinking, but something which is different from traditional thinking. It is Urteile. She was not able to write her last book, probably the most important one. But Urteile it is not something, but it is subsumption of the general, uh, specific and the general rule. It is going from specific unique and attempts to find to this unique something which, which I do not possess. How could I address something what I'm, I'm, I do not have instruments of possessing to address it, but I, I need to simply to confront with it, and this is the biggest issue. I'm without any kind of weaponry, without kind of definition, without kind of conceptuality, begrifflichkeit. But I need it. It is something what is, it is vitally important for me. I like it, I dislike it, I hate it, and so on and so on. It is vitally important for me. 
No, no, I, I totally agree with your definition of thinking. And um, the question of thinking is exactly the, the way you put it. It's the fact, the act of, uh, of uh, bringing a, 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 a singular experience to some kind of universal concept or question, of course. And it's not only, and what Heidegger brought is that it's not only bringing the individual case under some concepts like in, a, in Kant's um, uh, first critique, but under the questions. And so the question of being, for example, is a way to think about uh, many things. But but then what I add to that is not, is only that this, and Aaron does that too very deeply, is that this this very capacity of judging, and I agree that her the, the, her last and finished book is very central, the, the, the very capacity to do that is fragile. And, and that's very important because, of course, we can be prevented from doing that, from, from, from relating our individual experiences to universal concepts or questions. And, but I, I add another thing that, for example, um, she says, but of course, it would be too big a debate and we, we, it's not a topic today, but she says that uh, Heichmann was not thinking because he was just applying the, the rules and not, not bringing what he was doing under a universal concept or question. And I contest that. Of course he was. He, he had an idea of what was good for, for, the, for, for him and for, and for his country in the war. And if it implies to kill some people, but then it implies to kill some people. This is not the absence of thought. This is very much e very easy to to say, but the, there's no proof that the very opposition is not the very the ethical opposition is not between thinking and not thinking. It's between between thinking that leads to 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 vital help and thinking which leads to to criminal acts. And of course, this is why we condemn people in in courts because they thought that, that makes responsibility. There's no responsibility if it's the absence of thinking that uh, leads to act. So I think she, she, there is a, of course, but if you if you want to take Aaron seriously, then you have to go to responsibility thinkers just as uh, her her neighbors and, and, and some thinkers that I understand that went to responsibility question like Levinas and Jonas, for example. But, um, she she avoided the concept of uh, responsibility because she she was thinking in the ontological question and opposing thinking and not thinking, whereas the question is what are the consequences of thoughts? Thank you. Do we have more questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Konstantin Gepiji. I'm from Bichu also. Um, and my question, or my, my big comment, um, uh, is addressed to both uh, speakers. And at first, uh, shouldn't Professor Mikhailov uh, mention the question of re responsibility of thinkers, responsibility of uh, philosophers. Uh, and uh, I'd like to accept the situations and uh, this crisis, Ukrainian crisis, um, uh, from this. Uh, um, climate crisis and uh, COVID crisis, because in such cases the responsibility of uh, philosophers, of thinkers, uh, maybe is not so significant. Uh, but uh, as we speak about the Ukrainian crisis, um, it's almost completely was created. It's human created. It's um, created by thinkers also. And um, my question is um, most, uh, mostly about that um, uh, are we responsible uh, of taking, not taking bad ideas seriously? Because all this uh, aggression in Ukraine was preceded by a long uh, history of bad ideas spread in Russia. As for example, Dugin and, and much more thinkers like this. And uh, I think Western thinkers um, were not taking them all these ideas seriously because these are bad ideas, surely it's bad, stupid and harmful ideas. Uh, but are we responsible for not um, uh, taking um, uh, 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 enough attention to, to bad ideas? Thank you. Thank you for your question. 
I think still the topic of our conference should provoke us, stimulate us, not simply just to think about thinking and to pretend that all thinking about thinking has a certain kind of value while we are discussing it. The problem of responsibility it is ontological issue. It is the problem of my own behavior, my own acting, my own doing something, but not only talking about what is going on. A lot of those who comment what is going on, it's enough, more than enough. But we are always too late. There is a famous saying of Nikolai Gerdyaev. And for the thing, for the sins of Cain, I'm also responsible. It's very, very radical saying. For sins of Cain, I'm responsible. Of, of course, it's, it could sound very total, but still, it's again, we are not escaping responsibility of living on the earth and acting and doing something. Also, the temptation to escape it and to comment it and to find somebody who is guilty. Again, I'm coming to this uh, famous also uh, speech of, 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 of Kanechi. This poet criticizes himself for the not ability to contribute to preventing war. And he blames himself. A lot of those who could blame, and he has an, enough reasons to blame you know, those who make propaganda for, for, to create this war, but he blames himself. And again, we are coming here to the issue which was raised also about doing. Sometimes we too strongly believe in thinking, in power of thinking, and its ability to change reality in proper way. We live in this illusion at least some centuries and still believe in the progress. But the problem of progress is deprives us from actual participation and responsibility. So it is inevitably is going in positive way. The principle of hope, we expect, it should happen. It should happen, then, then I should a little bit relax, because it's inevitable progress. So I think at the last of the, at the last years of the last century, there was certain kind of confidence that we departed from terrible 20th century. So we enter a new epoch. So what? We needed an, another reminder, we need another signal, and we will reflect again and again how long it will take time. But if, in the meantime, something is going on all, of, all over the world. And our way of thinking and our pr principles of, of thinking are not very much appreciated in other parts of the world, Muslim world, also China and somewhere else, they do not share our confidence in principle of our thinking. We need in the time of globalization. And we speak about the crisis in, in Europe and in the United States and everywhere. So how could we expect that something is not functioning pretty well where it has been born? and it had been in existence for 2,500 years, is not functioning automatically, will function somewhere else, in different environment, where it has, they do not have antenna to receive such a kind of signals, which we are strongly believe. There are a lot of problems here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Worms. I want uh, to thank the answer and also for the question. I have a very brief answer because uh, it is just to say yes. Of course, we have a responsibility. Of course, we should have heard um, and, and studied and, and taken seriously the 
what was being said, said and thought all over the world and in Russia in the last uh, 20 years. So I think, yes, the responsibility is huge. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, audience. And now we have lunch break and we are here again in a couple of hours, so at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good lunch in Vilnius. <laughs> Bye -bye.